You are watching A Simple Way to Understand Magic. My name is Ricky Goodall, and I don't think that you should blindly believe anything that I'm going to share with you. I don't think you should blindly trust me or anyone for that matter. I think that you should question everything. Question your leaders, question your government, question your religions, question politics, question all of the icons or idols in your life and find a truth that works for you because I believe that truth needs no convincing. It was October 2015 and my business was failing. My girlfriend just broke up with me. I had no close relationships. I had no relationship to my family and I was completely miserable. I can't even count how many times I would find myself sitting in front of the TV, filling my mouth full of junk food, trying to numb away the pain that I was feeling. It was around that time that a man came into my life and asked me if I'd ever experienced magic before. Now, when I said magic, do you mean like black magic, like curses, hexes, like what do you mean? He said, well, that's one type of magic, but that's not the type of magic I practice. And so this presentation is going to be sharing with you what I learned in my magical journey from 2015 all the way till now through hundreds of magic and shamanic plant medicine ceremonies, the fundamental concepts and archetypes I learned about magic and what that means for each of us. Now, if this is your first video that you're watching of mine, I would suggest that you go back and watch A Simple Way to Understand God a simple way to understand ascension, and a simple way to understand higher self. Those videos will make the content in this video much easier to digest. If you can't watch those videos, or if you wanna watch this video first, that's totally fine. You can also watch this video, check those videos out when you have a chance, and then come back and watch this one again, you might learn more. So the first thing I wanna share with you is the three types of magic. So when I asked this mentor, what do you mean by magic? He said, well, there are three types of magic. There's black magic. Gray magic. And white magic. These magics are also referred to as low magic, middle magic or neutral magic and high magic. So the practice that I was learning was the practice of high magic at the bottom. So black magic is the magic of curses and hexes and it's intended to harm other people. Now the trouble with black magic is that the people that practice it are missing maybe one of the most, at least in my opinion, most important principles of magic. And that principle is as within, so without. Or in other words, what we put out comes back to us. So the trouble with practicing black magic, curses, hexes, trying to harm other people, trying to get their job, trying to get their girlfriend, trying to get their car or whatever, is that that frequency that we put out by trying to take from them, that brings us down to the competitive plane. On the competitive plane, what you put out, I mean on all planes, but on the competitive plane, what you put out comes back to you. So if I try to hurt somebody else, if I try to hex somebody or curse them, at some point, I'm going to receive that energetic signature back to me. So in other words, if I put a hex on somebody, the universe is gonna put a hex on me. If I curse somebody, the universe is gonna curse me. What we put out comes back to us. So black magic, in my opinion, uh, and this is no judgment, lots of people start in different places. I was a mixed martial arts fighter for a lot of my life and I used to imagine myself beating my opponent. In some ways, that's sort of a version of black or gray magic. But so no judgment, but in my opinion, if a person practices black magic, they're guaranteed to experience serious suffering in their lives because black magic, as you'll learn, is working with a different plane of reality. Gray magic, on the other hand, is magic sort of like the law of attraction, trying to attract things that you want. It might be visualization, trying to visualize the life that you want. It's neutral magic. It's not bad or good. It, it's just sort of in the middle. Now the trouble is, depending on what kind of magic you're practicing, it can very quickly become black magic. So it's important for us to remember the most important, besides as within, so without, is to never impede free will. If we impede free will, what we're doing is standing in the way of the one most important gift that our creator has given us all. We're, we've all been given the gift of free will. And so if I stand in the way of somebody else's free will, I'm standing in the way of the gift that God or creator or conscious universe gave to them. So if I practice black magic and I'm trying to impede the free will of another, that's gonna come back to me in heavy negative ways. 
So gray magic, again, is the magic of attracting or manifesting or really it's not, it's not healing magic like white magic, which you'll learn about in a minute. It's not cursing or hexing other people, but it's somewhere in the middle. It's the magic of manifesting. It's the magic of attracting. It's the magic of uh, desire in a, in a lot of ways. White magic is magic of desire too, because we're desiring to heal. But with white magic, what we're recognizing is again, as within, so without. My external world is a reflection of my internal world. So if I want to create an external world that matches my version of paradise or heaven or my dream world, what I need to do is change the internal programming that exists inside of me so that my external world matches my internal programming. If you don't know what that means, again, I suggest checking the other videos, a simple way to understand God, ascension, and higher self that will help you understand what I'm talking about here. In order for me to change the external world, I have to change my internal world. White magic is in my opinion, or high magic, the most effective way to achieve this. Because what we're doing is we're actually raising our consciousness to the level of our higher self, seeing our world from that perspective, and then we're able to, in a much easier way, find the programming that continues to create suffering for us. Let's check my notes here. Make sure I didn't forget anything. So yeah, gray magic could be law of attraction or a wedding or an oath. Uh, it, it's kind of neutral. It's a type of magic practice that isn't, again, it's not trying to hurt anyone. It's not trying to heal anyone. It's kind of in the middle. Now, the easiest way to, to understand magic using the symbols that you would have checked out in the other videos, you would have learned about in the other videos, we can kind of imagine it like this. If you remember, we have the Tetragrammaton, which represents God, Creator, or Conscious Universe. And then as the Tetragrammaton manifests, we create the Pentagrammaton, the image of our higher self. And then we have the three-dimensional character, identity, or ego. But today we're going to learn about a different version of ourselves, what I call the lower self. So as you can see here, I hope you love my little stickman drawings. So this is the realm of God, creator, or conscious universe. So the magic that happens up here is really just the manifestation or the creation of the universe. We, we don't, as human beings, uh, we don't really operate in this level. It's too high for us. We don't get past the higher self. Uh, through Jesus, we find God. So if you remember that that symbol represents Yahshua, which you learned about in the last couple of videos, uh, you'll know what I mean when I say that. This higher self is the realm of high magic. So when we're using high magic, we're connecting to the frequency of our higher self. When we use great magic, we're still living in a three-dimensional world. We're still using magic that's limited by our character. It's limited by our imagination or limited by our programming or limited by uh, the physical world and the time it takes to manifest things. And then black magic, we're kind of working with our lower self or our animal self or a demonic self. So what happens here is when we work with these lower vibrations of ourselves, we either use high magic and we start to rise in frequency or we practice gray and low magic. Gray magic, we stay where we're at. Low magic or black magic, we begin to get lower in our frequency. So I personally only practice high magic. Now, of course, great, that's not true. I don't only practice high magic. I practice gray magic indirectly. Every time I imagine something I want, I have a vision board over here. You can't see it on the other side of the camera. That's technically gray magic in some ways. But I recognize that in order for me to manifest those things on my vision board, I have to transform my internal world. So on my vision board, what I'm seeing is a reflection of my future as I do the inner work and as I heal myself and continue to raise my frequency into the frequency of my higher self. So for some examples of black magic are media propaganda. Most people are familiar with media propaganda. Fear, worry, stress, anxiety. We have to be afraid of all these different things. 
Another good example is voodoo dolls. So you've probably heard of voodoo dolls, maybe seen them in the movies. Curses, hexes, harmful spells, blood rituals or blood sacrifices. Those are all examples of black magic or lower magic. Examples of gray magic are, again, law of attraction, manifestation spells, lucky charms, vision boards, weddings, uh, all different types of gray magic. And then white magic would be shamanism, Reiki, energy healing, meditation, acupuncture, herbalism, Qigong, Yoga, Tai Chi. Now, someone might argue, well, how could acupuncture be white magic? Well, I mean, it's science, but it's also white magic. But you know, this is science too. It's a different type of science. It's just an ancient science that our people have all but forgotten. So there are some basic guidelines of high magic. And these guidelines were taught to me by my mentor, and then I continued to reinforce them as I studied different types of magic. So there are five guidelines. So here's your high magic guidelines. Now, these aren't rules. I, when I originally wrote this, I called them rules with in quotation marks, but I didn't even want to say that because in magic, number one rule or guideline is that intention is everything. Intention is everything. Or wait, no, that's not number one. That's number two. Number one is question everything. Question everything. Question, you have no reason to believe that Ricky Goodall even exists other than the image that's being created by your retina and that your brain is perceiving. You have, no, you have no proof that I actually exist. In fact, quantum science tells us that nothing is real in a sense that it's actually phys physical and, and solid and stuck in its ways. Everything is actually energy and it changes based on how we change. So we have to question everything. We have to be humble to the fact that I don't know what I don't know. And there can be so much more to the universe than I realize. You already know this one. I just said it. Intention is everything. So I've had a, a, I've had students, I've had clients ask me like, oh, well, you know, the Bible says magic is evil. Religion, some religions say magic is evil. What do I, what do I think? Well, intention is everything. So if my intention is to harm others, then uh, what I'm doing is I'm living from a place of ego or evil, and I'm, I'm resonating at that lower frequency that we talked about earlier. But if my intention is to uplift humanity or to uplift myself without harming or limiting or competing against others, then I'm living aligned with the, with the creator and that can't possibly be evil. So intention is everything. Very important to remember. Uh, number three, we talked about it earlier, what goes out comes back. So it's very important for me to remember that if I do a powerful enough magic ceremony, oops, uh, what goes out comes back. If I do a powerful enough magic ceremony, uh, I, could, I could have a really challenging couple weeks or month after that because the frequency that I create in the ceremony, I project it out of the universe. Now the universe has to create an echo that comes back to me and that could come in the form of, uh, I've seen people go through breakups. I've seen people's businesses close down because deep inside they didn't really want it. I've seen people, uh, lots of different things can happen, but it always leads to something better. So uh, the magic ceremonies are very powerful. It's important to make sure that we know what we're doing because what we put out comes back to us. This is the one that my mentor taught me that I'll never forget. There is only love in the universe. And now some people say, how can you say there's only love with all the evil in the world? all of the people starving, all the people dying. Because from a higher perspective of our creator, the people who are suffering now will eventually, if they come back, if you believe in reincarnation, they'll eventually come back and they'll work their way up. People practice evil, that evil will come back to them because what you put out comes back to you. And eventually their evil deeds will be neutralized because they will experience some level of suffering, some level of karma that will eventually neutralize it. They'll learn their lessons and they'll continue the inevitable evolution toward the higher light. There is only love in the universe. Everything that we think is punishment and suffering is actually just another version of love, the darker version of love, trying to teach us to move back to the light. So there's only love in the universe. And then my shaman taught me this, our heart is the greatest magician or the greatest healer. All of the greats in history great healers, great leaders, 
They never said, listen to me, I know everything. Don't listen to anyone else. They said, listen to your heart. You find your own truth. The truth is different for everyone. It's subjective. And so the greatest healer, the greatest magician, the greatest shaman is your own heart. And if you remember that, then that puts you at a level of the greats, the greatest in history. It doesn't matter whether it was Jesus or Buddha or Moses or King David or King Solomon or Paramahansa Yogananda. It doesn't matter who it is. And I'll talk about all of those in a few minutes. We're all magicians. We're all powerful individuals. We're all powerful healers, powerful shamans deep inside. Some of the other things I, I, I wrote down here is that high magic is really intended to raise the consciousness towards unity, oneness, peace, and prosperity. Great magic is meant to just really attract and create things into our lives and, and change the world from a physical realm. But high magic is meant to bring us up to the frequency of heaven on earth. And you might not believe in that terminology or maybe because of religion, that term heaven doesn't resonate with you. My next video is going to be called A Simple Way to Understand Heaven. And if you check that video out, you might realize that, oh, wait a minute, heaven actually is something that I resonate with. All ceremonies, rituals, and spells in high magic are intended to in, in resolve inner conflict so as to generate an external experience relative to the internal transformation. In other words, all magic ceremonies, rituals, and practices in high magic are designed to transform the internal world so the external world matches the inner transformation. If you've got pain and anger and hatred inside of you, then your external world will reflect pain, anger, and hatred. If you can heal that pain, anger, anger and hatred and turn it into love and prosperity and unity and oneness, that's the reality we will experience outside of us or that you will experience outside of you. In other words, heal the inside to change the outside. Heal the inside world to change the outside world. Now, there are some famous high magicians in history. You won't find this if you look it up, likely. These are my opinions, but King David, King Solomon, Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Paramahansa Yogananda, Bruno Groening, and others. Jesus, whether or not Jesus was an actual man that lived 2,000 years ago, that's not a, a conversation for this video, but I did talk about it in the other videos. If you've watched those, you already know my opinion on that. I believe that we are all Jesus. We are all the higher self. We are all Yeshua at the core and that the man we call Jesus was actually named something different likely and that Jesus was the title that was given to him. But again, that's a conversation for another day. I put a star beside this, this next point. Traditional high magic happens in a ceremony, which takes place inside of a magic circle. So we're going to start getting into, the, getting into the magic circle, which is also called a sacred circle, a medicine circle, a medicine wheel, sacred sphere. Uh, what else have we got here? Anything else? Probably other names too. You might know some others yourself. Those, yeah, transformation circle, magic circle, etc. The circle represents the macrocosm, a reflection of the everything, God, creator, conscious universe. And what we're doing is we're creating a microcosmic magic circle. And the idea is that whatever you perform inside of the magic circle is meant to be a reflection of what you want changed in the external universe. So what you create in the microcosm, or in other words, your magic circle, is what you're intending to reflect in the macrocosm, or in other words, the universe. So, so the, the magic circle represents the cosmic egg. It represents the universe. It represents uh, four seasons, four elements, four directions. So I'm going to use some symbols here in each corner so that we can have a different conversation about what they actually mean. So if you watched my last videos, you remember the elements. We talked a lot about air, fire, water, earth, and ether, and how they represent our our personal elements, our energy bodies. Oops, that's not right. It's not south either, it's east. I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> 
This was probably, what I'm about to share with you is probably the most fundamental uh, and profound experience of, of learning magic that, that happened for me. So the magic circle, circle repre it represents the, the, the universe, represents the east, the south, the west, and the north. Now, if you recall, uh, yeah, you should be able to see it in those, the air element represents our mental body. It represents our mind, and it also represents the direction east. The fire element represents our spiritual body, which is like our will, our courage, our energy, and the direction south. The west direction represents the element water, which is our emotional body, or our feelings, our pain, or our pleasure. The earth element represents our physical body, which is obviously our physical body, which is the direction north. What we're doing in a magic circle, again, this is my understanding, is we're, we're working with the four elements or working with the four bodies, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical body, so that we can create change in those bodies, which are also reflections of the elements, so that they can go out and change the elements in the universe. If you recall from the last videos, especially the first one, A Simple Way to Understand God, the entire universe can be classified in the four elements, fire, air, water, earth, and then ether, which is the quantum foam or the quantum realm beneath those elements. Likewise, our bodies are created of the four elements as well. The energy or electricity in my body is the fire element. The liquid in my body is the water element. The gas in my body is the air element. And then the matter is the physical element or the earth element. In a magic circle, we are acting as God, pretending that we're the microcosm to the macrocosm or we're the higher self, the child of God. And we're creating an intention which is installed in each of our elements or installed in each of our bodies. And then that intention sends, an, sends a frequency out into the other elements, which is the universe. As within, so without. We are a reflection of the universe. And then as a result, our intention reflects from the microcosmic to the macrocosm. So that might be deep, and you might want to watch that a couple of times to really understand it. So these different, these different archetypes, these different directions in a ceremony, so if you imagine you're standing here and, you know, east, south, north, west, these, they represent the, the, the four elements, the four directions, the four bodies, the four seasons, winter, summer, fall, spring. They represent the four stages of, of life, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and elderhood. They also represent the angels. So east is Archangel Raphael. Uh, south is Archangel Michael. Uh, west is Archangel Gabriel. North is Archangel Ariel. If you, don't, if you don't understand what the angels mean or you don't agree with them, or you don't resonate with them, that's okay too. Because the elements are intelligent in nature. They're intelligent forces of nature. So the ancient people personified them by giving them different names. Now in Babylonia, they were called different things. In Greece, they were called different things. But the ancient Hebrew traditions called them the archangels. Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, and Ariel. Those angels go out and transform the elements for us when we set our intentions. The old phrase, Jesus commanded the angels, in my understanding, is an analogy for us commanding our elements to create the reality that we desire. They also represent different archetypes, like uh, you remember from the last video, sun, uh, air represents the sun, fire represents the father, west represents the, uh, the mother, and earth represents the daughter. They also represent different animals, different depending on the uh, pantology or, your, or mythology you're actually working with. So in Peru, it's the jaguar and the hummingbird and the serpent and uh, the condor. Uh, in in uh, the Mi'kmaq traditions, it's, it's different animals. The bald eagle. Uh, in, uh, there's plants like cedar and tobacco and sage. And uh, I don't recall the other one at, the, at this moment. And then the names of God as well. They represent yod He vav He. Adonai, Eheye, uh, Agala. That's not important if you don't practice high magic yet, but eventually you might realize that you need to know these things and it will kind of stimulate some ideas. So this is a basic diagram of the magic circle. Now, when you're, when you're creating a magic circle in high magic, there are, the, the altar is typically in the east. Now, the altar represents the element ether. So what we do in high magic is we put all of our, our tools and our intentions and so on on the altar, which represents the element ether, so that the element ether can create at the, at the basic or fundamental levels, it can change how these elements respond in the world or reflect in the world. Again, this is deep stuff. 
It might not be for everyone. Maybe you're listening to this and saying, what is the point of any of this? Why do I care? Uh, and maybe now's not the time, or maybe you're just not interested, or maybe you're loving what I'm sharing right now. I'm sharing this information because uh, I love it, because it's my zone of genius. It's what I love to do. And I know that there are people out there that really uh, benefit from it. So there are tools in magic that help us uh, create what we want. So uh, when we put certain tools in the altar, they represent certain things. I have an altar behind the camera here with my different tools on it. So the altar represents ether. The uh, athame or the ceremonial knife represents the direction east or the element air. The wand represents the uh, direction south or the element fire. The chalice or the cup represents the direction west or water. Now, the, uh, and uh, the pentacle or the, the pen pentagram, it's like a little saucer with a, with a pentagram on it called a pentacle, represents the element uh, or the direction north and the element earth. Now, if you practice shamanism, or, or you might, uh, if you, you practice like Nor North American shamanism, you might use something different. You might use an altar still, but you might use a feather to represent the element east and, uh, or the direction east and the element air. You might use, uh, I'll do the fire last, you'll understand why in a second. You might use a, a, an abalone shell or a seashell to represent the element, the direction west and the element water. You might use sage or cedar to represent the direction north and the element earth. And then once you light the sage or the cedar on fire, you'll get fire to represent south or the element fire. So if you've ever seen a smudging little kit with like sage and a feather and a shell, that's representing the four elements, fire, air, water, earth. So that's like the uh, indigenous practice of this Western Kabbalistic alchemical magic uses the athame, wand, chalice, and pentacle, but the shamanic indigenous practices use the feather, the fire, the abalone shell, and the cedar. Now there are different parts of a ceremony of a high magic ceremony. This is just a basic um, summary, but it's different. It's different for everyone's practice. This is just really basic stuff. So the parts of a high magic ceremony are one, we set our intentions. So why are we actually doing the ceremony? This is typically something we might do hours, days, weeks, or even months, or even years in advance. You know, when you get married, it's usually uh, it's far in advance. So the intention is to get married. Uh, the second thing we, we practice is our prayers. So what, if we're praying to the elements, we're praying to the directions, we're praying to the angels, we're praying to God, we're praying to mother, father, there's some kind of prayers typically in a high magic ceremony. Next there are rituals. So rituals could be a, uh, one example of a ritual is the lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram or the uh, uh, lesser uh, banishing ritual of the pentagram or the uh, so there are supreme invoking rituals, invocation rituals, uh, lots of different types of rituals, middle pillar ritual, uh, Kabbalistic cross, lots of different types of rituals that you can practice in a high magic ceremony. The purpose of a ritual, in the most basic way to understand it, is to elevate the brainwave state. When we practice a ritual, especially if we practice it a lot of times and it's all but automatic, we can connect to higher brainwave states. The higher our brainwave states, when we start getting into the alpha, theta, and delta brainwave states, and if you don't know what those are, I'm not gonna explain it in these, this video, I would, I would look those up, they're miraculous brainwave states. When we get into higher brainwave states, we can actually work with reality in a much different way. We can transform our inner world, we can move reality, we can change the external world just based on our brainwave states. Yogis, uh, Buddhas, Lamas, uh, monks have been doing this for thousands of years. So rituals are one way to very quickly change our brainwave states. We can do spells, which are sort of like the climax of the ceremony. So a spell is usually like a single, like lighting a single candle and repeating a mantra it could be a spell, but a ritual could take 20 minutes. A spell might be a shorter period of time. Um, I won't get into the details of these things because it's just way too much. This is just very simple. And then another part of the ceremony 
uh, is the visions or the channeling that we experience, uh, which I call miracles. Now, there are lots of different types of miracles. If somebody is able to heal uh, years of trauma in one ceremony, I would call that a miracle. If somebody's able to get up and walk after having arthritis for years, I would call that a miracle. There are lots of types of miracles a person can experience in ceremony. I'm not allowed to talk about the miracles specifically. In some cases, I'll share little visions, but people can experience real miracles. Now, the last thing I want to share about is what's called an initiation ceremony. So if you've listened to my book, The Rise of the Authentic Self, uh, if you haven't listened to it, it's in the link in the description of this video. And I highly recommend it if you care about this stuff because I share a lot of my story in detail. I share some experiences of so-called miracles that, 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 I, that I experienced. I'm never claiming that I'm creating the miracles or that anyone else is creating the miracles. All we're doing is raising our brainwave state to a frequency where we connect to our higher self and then higher self creates the miracles. We're just on the, on the uh, uh, receiving end of it. So the, the, what I want to talk about is the initiation ceremony. The initiation ceremony is the first ceremony that we experience in magic when we're really beginning our magical path. Now, lots of people practice magic without an initiation ceremony, but an initiation ceremony accelerates and amplifies our experiences. So it's an ancient rite of passage. It's an ancient uh, analogy for our death and rebirth. So when we experience an initiation ceremony, what we're doing is working with an initiator, somebody who uh, is trained in initiating other people. And that person through oral tradition is initiating us into the practice of high magic. Uh, it represents the death of our ego or our lower self and the birth of our higher self. The initiations happen like baptisms or uh, anointings and, and lots of different types of initiations, Freemasonry, Illuminati, all these different practices. They have initiation. Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is an initiation. Fraternities have initiations. Lots of different types of initiations. As for high magic, th this is, this is the, the idea. It's the death of our ego or our lower self and the birth of our higher self. It's an oral tradition passed on from teacher to student. That's very important. Oral tradition is not something you can read in a book or even what I'm doing here is kind of giving you an oral tradition. But if we were sitting in front of each other and I was sharing you th this stuff with you, you'd be receiving a different energetic frequency from me. If you don't believe in this stuff, trust me, I didn't believe it when I started it. You really have to experience it to believe it. Initiation ceremony amplifies our magical abilities. So if, if you've got magical talents that you're aware of, or maybe that you're not aware of, initiation can amplify your abilities, whether that means uh, empathy, whether it means compassion or courage, or whether it means telekinesis, telepathy, transmutation. It can mean lots of different things. And uh, initiation ceremony in amplifies that experience. It can lead to flow. It can lead to amplified brainwave states. It can lead to miraculous healing of self or others. Uh, it can, it can, it can cr increase our experiences of, of healing and magic overall. It's essentially an electrical transference between the initiator and the initiate. So I don't know if I'm spelling that properly here, but that's okay. It's an electrical transference. So if the initiator has done a lot of deep work in themselves, if they practice a lot of magic, if they've learned a lot of things and they initiate you, in some ways you're going to receive the wisdom and the understanding that they've developed in their journey. You're going to in some way receive that, that magic, receive that magical ability. I was very fortunate to have been initiated by a very powerful magician. I'm very grateful for the uh, experiences that I had. So an initiation ceremony is really the uh, death and rebirth of our ego or our lower self so that we can begin the journey, which you learned about in A Simple Way to Understand Ascension, the journey of the path of the pentagram. Now, not all systems rep re recognize the path of the pentagram. They call it lots of different things, tarot, Kabbalah, alchemy, the alchemical process, but they're all based on this, this fundamental idea, which again, you can learn about in the other video, A Simple Way to Understand Ascension. Our initiation ceremony is really like right here where we're, we're going down and we're beginning the awakening stage. Uh, again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out those videos. It'll make more sense. When I was initiated in October, between October and November of 2015, my life transformed dramatically from that point forward. 
I completely changed. I was Ricky Goodall, the MMA fighter around that time. And that version of me got humbled very quickly. I went through different shamanic medicine ceremonies after that. I worked with high level coaches. I went through pilgrimages. I traveled to Peru multiple times, Mexico, California. It transformed my entire life. It showed me who I really am and what I'm capable of. So if you have the opportunity to be initiated by somebody in high magic, I strongly suggest it. Now, the thing is, I didn't look for this guy. I didn't even know that high magic existed. He came to me. So the first step is really setting the intention. If we want change, real dramatic change, I was going through a devastating breakup at the time and I was so sad and depressed. And that's when this magician came into my life. The teacher comes when the student is ready. So initiation is the acceleration and the amplification of our magical abilities and our healing process. It's an intense journey. It's not for everyone, but I guarantee you, if your goal is enlightenment, freedom, and liberation, initiation is like adding a jet fuel to the process. So if you enjoyed this video, Again, please check out the other ones. If you want to learn more about this stuff, check out my audio book in the link below, The Rise of the Authentic Self. It's free on YouTube. Uh, I'll have other links in the description of this video for other things you can check out, like my community, The Tribe. Uh, the Tribe is, uh, we create space for brave leaders to become superhuman. We've got members from all over the world. It's free to join. Uh, we have some uh, higher level memberships if you're looking for extra support. We've got lots of content, lots of different resources we share with our, our members. But most importantly, we have events that happen every week where we connect our members to other members. Uh, so this is important because when you're going through this journey, as you might have heard in some of the previous videos, Aristotle said, the mind has a mechanism of self-contradiction. So over time, our mind will actually begin to forget what we're learning about. It'll actually forget the miracles that we've experienced. So we need to be surrounded by people who can continue reminding us because we are the average of the five people we spend the most time around. So check that link out as well in the description, www.thetribe.me. We'd love to have you there. We'd love to see you at the tribe. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like it. Please share it with somebody you think could benefit. And remember to check out the other videos as well. Thanks for watching, everyone.